Well, recently, the Supreme Court issued a series of rulings that were cheered by progressive people all around the world. They reaffirmed that it is illegal to discriminate against employees on the basis of their sexual orientation. It struck down, temporarily at least, the attempts to deport tens of thousands of immigrant youth and struck down a Louisiana law that was designed to make it practically impossible for women to get abortions in that state. And of course, to set the stage for other states to do the same. Now, the jubilation was even greater because the current makeup of who's on the Supreme Court of the United States. A majority of the members are dyed in the wool right wingers and their judicial records are littered with atrocious decisions affecting the lives of oppressed and exploited people. So needless to say, anytime something comes up before the court that would take away hard won gains uh, that have you know, been enshrined or we thought they had been enshrined, it's certainly prudent to hold your breath. Now the question asks itself here, uh, how is it that such a terrible, horrendous group of people, which is pretty much handpicked because they are a terrible, atrocious, horrendous group of people, actually delivered some decisions here that have a basis in human decency, certainly a decency that many of their past decisions clearly lacked. And in fact, they seem to decide in the opposite direction in similar cases uh, at similar levels of their own careers. So right there, you have to ask yourself, why would they do this? Now, of course, there are some people who revere and support and love the American criminal legal system. And they would say, well, this is, of course, the way it works. That's why it happened the way it is, because the Supreme Court is just a neutral institution that looks at the law, evaluates it fairly, and then issues these decisions. They're guided by the law. So it shouldn't be surprising to you, regardless of the politics of the person, regardless of who appointed them, that something positive would happen. But the reality shows us that it's just not how it works. The Supreme Court is actually not neutral. It is supremely political. And the justices aren't just going to randomly depart from the politico-judicial movement that birthed them in which their entire lives and most of their social lives are completely intertwined just because they heard a decent argument from a lawyer. Obviously, this is a great narrative for the system itself because it makes it seem like the US, that US capitalism is completely fair and the Supreme Court justices are white knights standing against all pressures from outside politics to dispense what's fair and right amongst the broad masses of people. But the real story behind it is that there has to be something else in play. And from our point of view, it really is that something that's really right in front of our faces right now. That's the struggle of the masses of people and the stability of the country. We're right in the middle right now of a widespread revolt that's going on against racism and white supremacy. Everything almost, the very foundations of the country are being called into question in the context of almost a cultural revolution that's happening with the toppling of these statues and other things being challenged. There's perhaps the worst economic crisis since the depression of the 1930s, tens of millions of people uh, unemployed, about 15 more million people living in poverty right now than prior to the pandemic. And obviously, when I mentioned the pandemic, we're in the biggest public health crisis I mean, I don't know of all time is right, certainly of a recent generation, certainly anyone who's alive now. Uh, so all these things coming together, the government has also display, uh, displayed criminal negligence. They've uh, suppressed this protest movement. So all of these things coming together right now, it's a, it's, a, it's a heady brew. And it seems almost impossible to think that John Roberts, who's the chief justice of the Supreme Court and was the swing vote on some of these cases, uh, or at least one of them, I should say, that when he is considering this question and that, quite frankly, when the other judges are considering these questions, that the social impacts uh, do not enter into their minds to what it would possibly mean to challenge. I mean, these are movements that have brought in tens of millions of people, the LGBTQ movement for justice, the immigrant rights movement that's been raging in a major way since 2006, the struggle of women that is generations long for respect, dignity, and equality. Tens of millions of people have been drawn in in the context of, of that pre-existing movement and our current movement. Those things coming together could be tremendously destabilizing if the credibility of the law was questioned by these people who said, wait a second, maybe the US law does not actually stand for truth, right, and justice. Maybe it does, in fact, stand for oppression and exploitation. And that's when people start to raise different questions. The credibility of the law is crucial to the stability of the country. And historically, this is what we have seen with the way that the court has acted in moments of great upsurges, of, you know, 
positive and negative, unfortunately. But the way the politicians want you to view it, which is the way the media reinforces it, which is the team aspect of the Supreme Court. Well, if they put in, you know, ex-president puts in Y Supreme Court justice, then they're going to do the things that you want to see if you like that president or the things that you don't want to see if you hate that president or whatever it may be. But as I said, historically, we see this issue of struggle, this issue of the credibility of the law, and this issue of the stability of the country really comes to the forefront. Here's a good example. Chief Justice Earl Warren, who headed up the famous Warren Court, as it's known, and this is in the 50s, 60s, really in the 53 up until 1968. And the Warren Court is responsible for many, many of the most notable Supreme Court decisions, certainly many of the ones that you learned about in school. Brown v. the Board of Education, Miranda v. Arizona, that's your Miranda rights when you get arrested, Heart of Atlanta Motel Incorporated versus United States, that actually upheld the Civil Rights Act, as well as Gideon v. Rain, Gideon v. Wainwright, which was the case that enshrined the right for a lawyer. So you have the right to a lawyer, and if you can't afford one, that's the Gideon case there. And Griswold v. Connecticut, which legalized birth control. So, and honestly, that's not even the whole list. The Warren Court is sort of known uh, as almost the gold standard for liberal jurisprudence in many ways. And of course, its decisions are very much in comporting with some of the great mass movements that people right, rightfully revere in this country. But be that as it may, when you look at Warren, it's hard to really think that when Eisenhower appointed him in 1953, there was any desire for him to do all these things, that they would uh, that he would appoint a chief justice who would totally dismantle the legal basis for Jim Crow. I mean, that would have destroyed Republican electoral chances at the ballot box at that time, if that's why, you know, he was on the court, as it were. So, you know, from that perspective, that's one aspect of the sort of team thing that you have to realize. I mean, someone would appoint someone and they would do so much more. But even beyond that, you look at who Warren was as a person, because you could say, OK, Eisenhower didn't appoint him, uh, but maybe it was just a triumph of personal moral character. Um, unfortunately for him, also not true. Warren's pre-court political history is it's honestly unbelievable. I mean, it's extremely racist. He was one of the earliest and most enthusiastic supporters of the World War II era internment of Japanese Americans. But even worse than that, he used those national security arguments to manipulate these racist laws in California to bolster the, where, by the way, he was the attorney general, then the governor, to bolster the stealing of lands from owners of land that were of Japanese descent and what some have called the biggest land grab or one of the biggest land grabs in California history, which is certainly saying a lot since the entire state is made up of stolen land. Warren also provided over, uh, presided over the state's eugenics program. Yes, California had a eugenics program. It was uh, focused on the forced sterilization of oppressed groups and disabled people at state hospitals. And he was also a noted member of the Native Sons of the Golden West, whose mission was to keep California a white man's paradise. So yes, this is the guy who also wrote the decision in Brown v. Board of Education. Hard to believe that he wrote it just out of the kindness of his heart. So what really changed between the two phases there? It really, the thing that changed was the intersection of the Cold War and the Civil Rights Movement. Now it's well known and well documented that in the White House and in the halls of Congress, the reason civil rights became so undeniable at the point in history that it did was that the movement exposed that the ruling class's struggle against communism was essentially hollow because it showed this capitalist hypocrisy in bold relief because here you are the United States allegedly for democracy with the fascist dictatorship over the southeastern portion of the country. And it seems very clear that Warren and the rest of the court, just like I mentioned about Roberts and the rest of the court earlier, were fully aware of this. It stands to reason that the Warren court's legal vision was very much colored by how the blatant hypocrisy of the U.S. legal code undermined the credibility and the stability of the same legal code, the same country, and ultimately the same struggle for capitalist United States to rule the world and to ultimately defeat the uh, Soviet Union, as it were. And again, as I just said, you can see the parallels for today. The issues at stake, as I mentioned earlier, have drawn in so many people, they've touched on so many crucial issues that to go against them would create a situation where people would start to ask serious questions about the nature of the law. Is it this same neutral instrument? Is it just there, the blind lady justice? Or is it what we've seen it is over time, the instrument of the ruling elites? I mean, who really makes the law, right? He who has the gold makes the rules in this society. So Supreme Court decisions, 
movements, whether we're talking about the civil rights movement, whether we're talking about our own current moment here, even whether we're talking about the right wing backlash to some of these progressive movements over time, you see Supreme Court decisions often have a sort of historical tilt to them where the mood of the country often determines the mood of the court because the overall issue becomes securing. This is the Supreme Court's role to secure the law, secure the credibility of the law, i.e. the state, the government that presides over us all and, and presides over this extremely unequal society. And that ultimately, if you really want to affect the Supreme Court, the way to do it isn't voting, which we're always said, or some having a good president who brings someone in. Ultimately, I think the lesson has to be that if you want to affect Supreme Court decisions on big issues, you have to build a massive movement that can exploit every bit of U.S. hypocrisy on the world stage and leverage that for real change.